there's a new $101 million prize for reversing ageing. You might be thinking, wait, what? We can reverse ageing now? Well, maybe. And the prospects are serious enough that some ultra-rich donors have put together an enormous prize pot for anyone who thinks they can manage it. It's called XPRIZE HealthSpan, and it's a seven-year competition with the goal of improving how healthy people are by the equivalent of 10 to 20 years. So what is HealthSpan? Can we really reverse ageing? And with all this talk of hundreds of millions of dollars, is this just for the billionaires? I decided to speak to two of the people in charge of the new XPRIZE to find out a bit more about it. Hi, I'm Peter Diamandis. I'm the founder and executive chairman of the XPRIZE Foundation. I'm Jamie Justice, and I'm the executive director of XPRIZE HealthSpan. So, Peter, Jamie, thank you so much for joining me. I'm obviously a huge fan of ageing biology research, because I think the cool kids seem to be calling it these days longevity or health span research. To the point, in fact, I changed my career from physics to study biology and, and ended up working on writing a book, but that's another story. But all of that is to say that I'm really excited by the idea of a big money prize for ageing biology. And I really want to dig into some of the thinking behind having an X prize for health span at all, like where the idea came from, what you hope it'll achieve, and why this is a really exciting time for longevity science. But I thought I'd start with what to me is the obvious question. Why $101 million? Uh, when this prize got planned and the first step is going out to raise the money, which is never easy. It took me six years to raise the $10 million for our first spaceflight X prize. Uh, I was able to land a incredible gentleman, Chip Wilson, the founder of Lululemon, to join. And he put up a quarter of the prize. He put up $25 million. And he asked me in that same conversation what the largest prize was. And I said, well, it's $100 million from Elon Musk. And I was planning this health span X prize to be $100 million as well. And he said, can we make it larger? Do you mind if we make it $101 million? I said, if you put the extra million in, I'm all set. So, so it's basically sort of within the X prize one-upmanship, which is fantastic. <laughs> yes, I kept on waiting for Elon to come back and say, let's make it 102 on his. But <laughs> This is the kind of arms race I can get behind. And the next question is, um, what do you need to do to win all of that money? The winning team has to demonstrate that their therapeutic treatment, when given for one year or less, can restore muscle, cognitive, and immune function that is equivalent to offset declines expected in 10 years, with a maximum reach goal of 20 years. And do you have to tick all three boxes? Is it okay to improve musculature, but not quite improve cognition so much? Like, how, how are you going to work that out? No, you have to hit all three. Uh, hopefully, you'll if you don't have the capacity, because I know a lot of companies that are focusing on muscle alone, then you'll go and find a team and team up with them. You know, Andrew, when we, when we started uh, the competition, and we're trying to figure out what we're going to measure, because when we put up an XPRIZE, what you measure is everything. Are you measuring you got to a particular altitude with your spaceship or you pulled a certain amount of carbon out of the atmosphere? Uh, and the realization was what really matters is function. Do I feel better? Am I able to mount an immune response to an influenza vaccination? Am I able to have my memory that I had 20 years ago? Do I have the muscular function and strength to climb the stairs and do the things I want to do? So ending up with a functional uh, set of metrics here is what really matters in, in the final result. So this is less of a competition around age reversal. It's more of a competition around function restoration. Um, and so do we have the function that you had 10 years ago or 20 years ago? And hopefully it goes beyond just these three tissues and systems. You know, if you're really developing a, um, a therapeutic that addresses aging uh, will measure in these three systems, but hopefully it hits a multitude of systems in the body. Each one of those categories are a small umbrella category. And so with muscle, it really is something that encompasses fitness and exercise capacity. So looking at something like a cardiopulmonary exercise test that can be done on a treadmill, where you get a measure that's like a, a VO2 max or a VO2 peak. Um, we also have really nice measures for muscle mass that can be done using either biologic specimens. So actually, it's a really quick urine test that can be done that can quantify very, very well your muscle mass. You know, cognitive function, again, so important. And there's not one measure of cognitive 
cognitive function. There's a little bit of everything. How quickly can I think? My That's called processing speed. Can I alternate between two tasks really quickly? That's a task of executive functioning and attention. Um, do I remember my grocery list when I'm walking through a store? Those are things like episodic and working memory. And so we'll have multiple functional measures again and then supported by at least one biospecimen or imaging or sort of concrete measure that's not just function, but just to make sure, right, is that people aren't just training the tests that we're using to measure it, but really making sure that there's something in the biology that's being supported. What kinds of interventions are you expecting here? Because I know that you're quite sort of um, open to various different approaches. Obviously, there's lots going on in longevity science at the moment. There's there's diet and exercise, sort of the basic stuff that I think a lot of us you know, maybe know we should be doing slightly better at. There's supplements, there's new drugs that we're hoping might slow down the aging process, a lot of which haven't quite made it into human clinical trials yet. Um, what, are you, what are you expecting the sort of participants to look like? We are going to see all kinds, but uh, we're looking for something that makes a fundamental difference. Looking for something that actually moves the needle. You know, it's not going to be a new exercise protocol. Uh, you know, I'm expecting we're going to see things that are pushing the edge from cellular medicines uh, to epigenetic reprogramming uh, to, um, you know, things we haven't yet really seen in even animal models yet. You know, anyone anywhere can come up with the next great idea. And so we are not telling people what can and can't be used. Safety is a top priority, right? We're looking at legal and ethical um, upstanding <laughs> competitors for sure. Um, and we also will do sort of safety checks um, along the way and make sure that that is a top priority. Um, but that said, you know, any intervention does carry risks and we understand and appreciate that. And sometimes you have to do the early stage testing to figure out what and how it works, at least within certain bounds. And this is a space that I worked in as a scientist and there is so much excitement in the area. And so some of the therapeutics that can come out, we know that in the U.S. there has been something called an inter interventions testing program in mice. And that has given us a really nice early read about certain therapeutics or certain interventions that can actually extend median lifespan in animals. Um, so whether that's like rapamycin or metformin or, you know, NAD booster. So there's a lot that's working in that space. Um, I also have had the, the personal connection to newer classes of drugs, things like senolytics and senotherapeutics that target particular cell types. Um, those have shown really strong preliminary effects. And those are drug categories primarily, but we're not limiting this to drugs, right? So this is also, there's so much excitement as well around there's new chemical reprogramming. Um, so this is cellular reprogramming, epigenetic reprogramming, um, that there's some of those are really in the very early stages of preclinical testing, um, but have great promise if we can use this as a vehicle to help shepherd those through into uh, testing in humans within the next few years. Um, we are also inviting devices. Um, there are also really great promise from different stem cell-based therapies and biologics. Um, interesting work happening right now in vaccines uh, that have applications to aging, um, you know, and any combination thereof. There really are lots of great ideas in aging biology at the moment but frustratingly few of them are actually being tried out in people. Hopefully this X Prize is an opportunity for that to happen. If you want to learn more about the drugs Jamie just mentioned, you might enjoy my recent video on the most promising real anti-aging drugs. And if you've not heard of epigenetic reprogramming, well, that's a really interesting topic, which can apparently reverse aging in cells, maybe reverse aging in mice, and has recently received billions in private investment, including from Amazon founder Jeff Bezos. All of which is to say, it really deserves a video all of its own. And this one is definitely on my to-do list. So I'll stick a link in the card and in the description when that comes out. All right, back to the interview. So as I understand it from the rules of the competition, you have to start with someone who's between 65 and 80 years old. But I was wondering, what, what is the actual sort of hard baseline here? Because imagine you've got someone who's, you know, in their 60s, but they're super fit and healthy. It's going to be m that much harder to improve their measurements by you know, 10 years, 20 years than it is someone who's you know, sedentary, doesn't do much exercise, perhaps eats some of the wrong things. So what's the sort of uh, control group in this experiment? So great question. And you absolutely have nailed it. As a 65-year-old is not a 65-year-old, it's not a 65-year-old. 
we'll be coaching our teams. Again, this is another one of those areas is that we're, we're keeping it really pretty open. People can define that population. Um, we're just giving them you know, sort of loose bounds as you know, we recommend they don't have a major life-threatening illness. So as a trialist, it'd be in your advantage to look for a population who does have at least some level of sort of low-level functional loss that's observed uh, so that you can actually show an improvement in that year. You have a better chance of being able to, uh, to push improvement. Um, so again, that could be you know a sedentary population. That could be somebody who has, uh, or a group that might have a little bit of slowed walking speed. Um, maybe tests on general cognition are a little bit lower, but not dementia and AD. Um, because again, on each side of that scale, you don't want somebody who's a little too far down that would be hard to show an improvement just because there's already been so much functional loss or disability. Um, but also, as you mentioned, you know, it, it, it might be harder. We don't know. Maybe it won't be to find somebody who's maybe, uh, you know, a 75 year old marathon runner. <laughs> it might be hard to improve their function or fitness. And every individual is a control for themselves. So when we go into this competition, Andrew, we're going to go in and measure the individual at baseline and then measure them again at the end of the therapeutic treatment a year later. So if they're in fantastic shape um, and you've chosen that as one of your subjects, that's your choice. Um, you know, we want to make sure that teams are not trying to you know, put everybody in a year bed rest before they give them, <laughs> uh, give them a treatment. But um, the size of the cohort is going to be up to the team. The makeup of the cohort is going to be up to the team. They have to prove statistical significance that they've moved the needle at least a decade with a target of 20 years. Where's the money come from? Who's put up this $101 million? Peter? Mm. Yeah, uh, I wish I put it all up. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> uh, the hundred, we actually raised $141 million, to be clear. Uh, $101 million for the main prize, $10 million for a bonus prize for a muscular dystrophy called FSHD and then 30 million of operating dollars. Uh, the lion's share comes from two individuals, uh, a foundation out of Riyadh and Boston called Hevolution, um, which is a multi-billion dollar foundation focused on aging, and they've committed at least a half a billion dollars a year in investments um, and, uh, and research grants. They're, they've become the largest funder of this, air, of this field. I've ra been raising money for this prize for the better part of five years. It took a while. Um, surprisingly, because I figured, you know, who wouldn't want to put up the money? You pay really only on success, and you've just bought yourself extra 20 healthy years. I figured we'd have lots of individuals racing towards it. Wasn't quite the case. So Evolution put up $40 million. Uh, Chip Wilson, uh, the founder of Lululemon, uh, who has this muscular dystrophy, FSHD, uh, put up $25 million. Uh, initially, as we discussed, increased it to $26 million. Uh, to uh, one up by a million dollars, Elon Musk's $100 million carbon prize. And then he added another $10 million bonus purse for anybody who can make a dent in his muscular dystrophy. And then we have a group of um, another dozen, 15 or so individuals, um, uh, folks ranging from uh, uh, Howard and Nancy Marks to Howard Morgan to uh, Christian Angemeyer, myself as a major donor. Um, uh, uh, anyway, a wide range of individuals who've put up anywhere from a million to 10 million. I was actually very excited to see that Chip Wilson had put so much of his own money up because I think it's just, it's surprisingly rare for people who are very rich to put their money toward longevity research. And what I've been sort of wondering about for a while, I was wondering what your thoughts on this are, is how can we get people more interested in this? Because if I was a billionaire, sadly I'm not, but if I was, I think I'd give away like 995 million to research into aging I, I agree. I could not agree more. It's like, you know, let me just, for those listening, you still can't take it with you. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm on stage a lot uh, in front of large audiences from, you know, uh, YPO groups to large wealth management groups. And, and I asked the question, I said, listen, at the end of the day, if, uh, if I could give you 20 healthy years of extra life, how much of your wealth would you give up for that? And those who are honest and the vast majority in this conversation end up getting there, say, at least half their money, right? And uh, so there's a disconnect between that realization 
that uh, you know you can leave it to your kids and ruin their lives. You can leave it to your lawyers to give away, or you can do something with it actively right now to make a dent in it. Uh, my largest donation I've ever made in my life is to this prize. Uh, I believe in it uh, heartily, and it's going to be you know health is the new wealth. Um, there's one of my favorite sayings, the man or woman who has their health is a thousand dreams. The man or woman who does not has but one. Uh, finally, I'll just say that the study that came out, I don't know, 18 months ago or so out of Harvard London School of Business in Oxford that said, for, if you could extend the health span of, of the population of Earth by just a year, uh, it's worth $38 trillion to the global economy. That's pretty impressive as a stat. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, actually, it's not even the Earth. It's literally just the US that figure applies to. So is that, is that just the United States? That's a phenomenal amount of money. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, you know, governments, the ultra-wealthy people who are able to invest in this stuff are, are leaving that sort of, you know, leaving that on the sidewalk effectively. Yeah, no, and you're right. And I think that's something that's really unique and is often lost is, you know, investing and looking for solutions that target our health and healthy aging is that the impact of that is far greater than investing in just trying to cure a certain disease and, and trying to fundraise and drive philanthropy and look for solutions on individual diseases, most of which go up with aging, you know, is that we might actually be missing some of the most important investments that are available, is that if we cured cancer, there's been some really nice modeling work done by, um, by J.L. Shansky and teams in the U.S. If you eradicate all cancer, the net effect on life expectancy really isn't that great. You might only be looking at another one to two years. If you want to make a dent in Alzheimer's disease, how about you focus actually investing in aging? <laughs> because this is the way to get there. Um, and at the same time, looking at cancer, at the same time, looking at cardiovascular disease, at the same time, looking at health. Absolutely. And I think that's probably one of the most important things that this prize and anyone talking about this stuff needs to do. Because I think um, from the few ultra wealthy people I've spoken to, the difference between them and the person on the street is just that they've got a lot of money it doesn't necessarily mean they're any more informed about the science or any healthier yeah right. absolutely and so we just need to get that word out there that aging biology is a thing you can invest in it might sound less conventional than you know cancer or heart disease or dementia and i think one of the challenges is that you know when you think about if you're a politician or someone who's got a lot of money you know your relatives who have died of cancer or had a heart attack but you don't sort of join the dots and realize it was the aging process that caused those things to happen amen <laughs> <laughs> Another challenge that I wanted to get um, both of your thoughts on was when I talk about this stuff, I find that I get a lot of really big ethical questions thrown at me, which I just wouldn't have if I was a cancer researcher. You know, someone puts their hand up at the end of the talk and I almost always get a question, what are we going to do with all the people if we carry on, you know, extending people's healthy lifespan? Or isn't this just only going to be available to the ultra rich? Or what about if billionaires and uh, dictators can live forever or something like that? And I just was wondering, you know, how do you feel that we can get the word out that this is no different from any other kind of medicine, which is how I see it? You have to attack the critique one at a time. So let's do that. On the issue of, oh my God, the planet's already overpopulated. And if we all live longer, it's going to, you know, cause a huge overpopulation problem. It's just wrong. Uh, we don't have that problem. We have an underpopulation problem that's coming. If you look at the numbers, they're very clear. 50 years ago, the average number of children per family globally was about 5.5. Um, today, it's dropped down to close to 2.3. The replacement number is 2.1. The United States is, other than you know, uh, immigration process, the U.S. is below the replacement level in terms of reproductive rate. Uh, most of Europe, uh, China massively below the reproductive rate, uh, the replacement rate, uh, as is a good part of Asia. The only part of the world that is really uh, got a profundity greater than, um, than replacement is Africa. And as we begin to continue to educate, provide energy uh, and, and, and better tech to Africa, that population growth rate will drop as well. The second thing is uh, the issue of inequality. And one thing that XPRIZE focuses on is really delivering solutions that are demonetized and democratized. You know, I've spent 20, 30 years focused on that area, both within XPRIZE and Singularity University and my other companies. And uh, one thing is true across almost all medical um, procedures and approaches is if 
this is a uh, a technology a medicine procedure uh, that is done for the very few, then it's super expensive. If it's done for the masses, then it's basically cheap. I mean, the best example I've heard came from a conversation with George Church. He said, listen, gene therapies that are for rare diseases can cost you a half a million bucks to $2 million you know, for a gene therapy. But if you look at uh, the mRNA COVID vaccines, and they'll cost you, you know, a buck a piece when you're producing in the hundreds of millions or billions of doses. And the good news is our biology, human biology is the same globally. It's not like we have different subsets of, of human aging. It's human aging. Um, and uh, we all die from the same disease called aging. And so there is a massive demand um, and, you know, another truism <clears throat> in technology is when the technology, when it begins uh, and it's available only for the wealthy, it doesn't work very well. Um, you know, the cell phone is an example. You know, the first cell phones on the streets of Manhattan cost a million bucks and they drop your call every two blocks. Now, when they cost 30 or 40 bucks uh, and available to the poorest children in favelas around the world, they work incredibly well. And so this is, you know, the democratization, demonetization, dematerialization of these products and services. So we're going to see the same forces at work here. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually, I've gone into quite a lot of detail about this. If anyone, any viewers are interested, I'll stick a link to the free extra ethics chapter of my book in the description, where you can go and check out some of my answers to gain a little bit more depth. I want to jump in and tackle just one piece of this, is that, you know, when I talk to people about like, oh, you're going to keep people alive longer, and isn't that a, isn't that a negative consequence? I think one thing that's really important for people to remember is that this longevity revolution has already happened. Like we're currently living it. Is there more potential to live longer? Probably. But what we're looking at right now is in the last 100 years, we've already doubled human life expectancy. We already are here for an additional 30 years. You know, when we're looking for solutions that we're trying to drive into clinic right now, is that, you know, that what we're looking at is improving health. Because even though we might have extended our lifespan by 30 years, the gap between how well we're living in those years has not kept pace. Not by a long shot. Um, and so really what we're trying to do is drive innovative solutions, not just to create more people, but to improve the quality of life and the resource use for the people that are already here. <laughs> so this is, it's a twofold problem. And so, you know, one of those things that we can do is actually, you know, try to improve, again, the amount of I don't know if you want to call it work span necessarily, but the time spent productive, contributing, autonomous, um, and that that's really, really critical actually for offsetting some of that resource use that we're talking about. Um, and so again, these are meant to be practical solutions to actually improve health. Um, and that the, the, the net benefit to that, I think, really will be at the societal level to make things like the cost of living and the quality of living in later life um, much, much better. And it gives us a way, as Peter already said, to democratize health um, and to make this, um, you know, viable and equitable solutions for all. And we have ways of trying to prioritize that. Um, but, you know, again, I think a, a real key here is we we're really looking for applicable solutions now. Um, and, you know, and there's also is an assumption that every life, you know, I also don't want to shirk away from, you know, our, our responsibility to consider this as a global and a, and a planetary solution is that, you know, yes, if we do have more people here, it's not saying, you know, that we shouldn't also say that we should also change our resource use is that I think, you know, this abundant future, and I try to keep very future positive is that, you know, I think that there are ways that we can also talk about sort of life and health span. Um, and at the same time say, and we do have a responsibility to give back to our planet and to look, make sure that we're, we're using the years that we're given uh, appropriately in a way that can actually benefit the planet. And I think this is a, it's a, it's a great global challenge and um, one that we're at least respectful of. Um, but again, I, t I tend to stay really positive is that it's not an and or, you know, it's not an or, it's an and. It's like we can do this together and we should also be mindful of our, our footprint on the planet. Yeah, I wonder if we should call it fun span rather than work span. I think that's better. Work span does not sound great, does it? <laughs>
<laughs> but I think what's yeah, what's really exciting about this stuff is that you can, when you're staying healthy, you can still travel, you can still play with your grandkids, you can still engage in your hobbies. And I think that's, you know, that's ultimately, it's, it's the human connection that I think life is all about and it's enabling that to continue. So I'm going to try and uh, try and get that into the lexicon. And talking of things that are fun, um, this is a prize, not just, um, you haven't just handed out the money to researchers, um, which is obviously a bit more of an exciting way of doing things. But I was wondering, why did you choose to offer this as an X prize rather than just, you know, getting your $100 million and doling out what you thought were the most promising bits of aging biology research at the moment? So, you know, I mean, that's what we do at XPRIZE. We put up large-scale competitions, and we do it for a few different reasons. One is this is a way of leveraging capital, right? If, you're, if you've got $100 million to dole out and you fund 10 teams, $10 million each, then that's it. You've got 10 teams. You know, we're close to 100 teams registered at this point, and I expect we will be north of 500 teams in this competition. Uh, we had about 1,600 teams enter the competition that I was able to get Elon to fund for gigaton carbon removal. Long story short, <clears throat> uh, it's about leverage, right? So uh, for every dollar of prize money, uh, we'll get a minimum of 10 times that spent by the teams. If you actually look at the benefit to the entire ecosystem, it's close to 30 times the prize purse. So a $100 million prize hopefully will drive <clears throat> north of, of uh, you know, uh, $3 billion um, or more, uh, com- you know, basically spent going after this. Uh, the second thing is when you're, you've got a research budget and you're handing out grants, you're basically choosing the winner before the actual work gets done. Um, You're basically saying, you know, I like your academic background. I like your thesis. Here's the money. Good luck. They may or may not be the best solution. When you are, you know, the adage that a friend of mine says, looking for a needle in the haystack, an X prize is a way that the needle comes to you. So you're only supporting the top winners at the end of the game. So uh, it's leverage of capital and it's crowdsourcing solutions. And it's a different approach. Uh, And, you know, one of my favorite sayings is the day before something is truly a breakthrough, it's a crazy idea. Um, If it weren't a crazy idea the day before, it wouldn't be considered a breakthrough. It'd be an expected occurrence. But if you're looking for real breakthroughs, then you have to have a mechanism that enables you to um, embrace and support crazy ideas. Uh, And unfortunately, peer-reviewed science doesn't really do a great job at that because the peers that are reviewing the science, um, you know, they're the ones that set the standards. And if some massively disruptive approach comes in, they're no longer the experts anymore. You know, I I define an expert as someone who can tell you exactly how something can't be done. So um, (laughs) for these reasons, um, X prizes are are a different approach. Um, You know, I like to say not everything is prizable and not every prize is an X prize. But this one was, you know. Prizes in science have a long history, with perhaps the most famous being the series of prizes offered in the 18th century by the British government to measure longitude i.e. find a way to measure how far east or west you were if you're travelling on the high seas. The best things to give a prize for are areas where you've got some idea of what the solutions might look like. You just need to encourage some people to actually take the plunge and move something from the drawing board to practical implementation. Which is arguably where ageing science is right now. Prizes aren't the right way to fund all science, but they can work well alongside more traditional funding structures. So, fingers crossed that this one can shake things up a bit. I asked some of my followers on social media if they had any questions for it, and I picked a few just to ask you. Um, We're going to have to keep these answers nice and short, because I know you're tight on time. First, from Linus Peterson. Why health span and not longevity? Health span, because health is what really matters. Longevity was going to be a hard prize to demonstrate someone lived 20 extra years. We'd have to wait a couple of decades to give it out. Got another one from Ira Pasta. He says, treating a large cohort of old people for a year with cocktails of gene therapies and stem cells and so on might cost way more than 101 million. And so what, do you have any concerns about that? And I guess his point being, um, taking the example of the TAME trial, that's going to cost about 70 million, I think, on the estimates I've seen. And that's for a drug called metformin, which is essentially, you know, cost pennies. The drug's almost free. It's just the infrastructure of the trial. So if you're going to have things that are more expensive than that, you're going to burn through your 100 million pretty rapidly. (laughs) 
Yeah, so you're right. So again, as a as a former executive committee member on the TAME trial, I spent about eight years <laughs> working behind the scenes on that thing. Yes, for that's a large scale trial. That's a three thousand person, fourteen to seventeen site trial that was geared towards the FDA. That five year period. What we're looking at these are early stage trials. We're asking people to want to run one year trial, early phase much smaller on the scale of between 40 to 200 people is our rough estimate. So again, per trial, it's going to be less expensive um, than something like the TAME trial. Um, so that's that's one thing. But the second is, yeah, absolutely. We expect that teams are going to need to go out and raise funds, get investments and drive this field in order to run those trials. That's the point is that we want investment into this space. And this is why we prize it versus fund it up front. And I've got a follow-up question from aging biologist Shao Pedro de Michael Hayas, and it's basically the opposite, which is actually, you know, could this prize almost be too easy? Because um, so what he says is, very interesting, congratulations, uh, but he'd be interested to know some more details. For example, what would you consider an appropriate control? Because if we do this in the general population, then standard lifestyle interventions like exercise might suffice because so many people have unhealthy lifestyles. And I guess that's, you know, we've seen that you can live 10 plus years longer if you tick a few boxes in terms of healthy lifestyle stuff. Perhaps you could in a year turn that around. By the way, just to be clear, it's the team that does the most. So if it is easy and a team comes out and does it easily for 20 years, another one does it for 30 years or 35 years, we're, we're good to go. So if it's easy, great. Let's exceed the 20-year target. Yeah. And I would say as a scientist, it's really great to sit back and say, oh, it's going to be easy until you actually are the one doing it. <laughs> and I have to tell you, those that are really serious in this field know that the challenge that we're putting out for these teams to show this across three systems, if we could do this really easily with a lifestyle intervention, it would already be done. Um, I have to tell you, it's not going to be that easy, uh, especially not to go across all three. This is going to take a lot of effort and it's going to take really innovative solutions in order to make a dent. Um, so many of my scientist friends, when I presented this yesterday to a crowd of scientists, you know, had both camps as well. The majority come up to me and say, I don't think anyone's going to win this. <laughs> you know, And the others, I'm going to say, well, let that drive you. Let that get you out of bed and make you work towards it because it's out there. And a final question from Anti-Rhetoric. One year of professional attention given to motivated subjects might not translate into the general population, because obviously if you can you know, really tightly constrain someone's diet or exercise and make sure they're taking all their drugs on time and that sort of thing. So are there any incentives in the competition to try and ensure accessibility and affordability for the resulting treatments? We have judge criteria um, within that about accessibility and affordability. Again, those are not part of our awarding metrics for what is what drives the funds, but we do have within our rubrics for our judges is that those are considerations. These are meant to be early stage proof of concept. We're getting people out there showing one year solutions. They're going to have to go on and do additional testing. Um, you know that there has been. I had some other folks saying it's like, oh, would you do this as sort of like a as a, as a metered award that you give some now at the end and you have to follow, give the rest of the amount five years later. You say, we can't really structure the prize that way. This is a prize, not a not a trial. <laughs> and there's going to need to be follow-up testing once things go into market. But, you know, but we're here to support that and help make that transition possible. Thank you both very much and really good luck with the prize. And I hope we can speak again in seven years to find out who's won. And hopefully we might even be a bit biologically younger, even if we're seven years chronologically older. I'm counting on it. Yeah, Andrew, how about you join us before that? Follow us along for our Milestone Awards. See what's happening in the R&D space and check in with our finalists. All right, see you soon. Take care. Thank you. All in all, I'm excited about this new HealthSpan X Prize. The fact we can debate whether it's too easy or too hard and get into the weeds about whether $101 million is an enormous quantity of money or just not enough for this kind of prize means it's in kind of a sweet spot where a prize really has a chance to make a difference. If we had a $101 billion prize pot, we probably wouldn't need a prize. We could just fund science the old-fashioned way. And actually, I think we could have a decent shot at curing ageing. If the prize was for one year of age reversal, that would be too easy. And if the goal was making people live to 120, it would obviously be too hard, at least with current technology. And not to mention it would take far longer than seven years to prove that your method had worked. So it's a really interesting prize, coming at a really interesting time. And for the final word, I thought I'd hand the mic back to Peter to explain why, with enough research funding, this could be a very exciting decade for ageing biology. I've been after this, you know, ever since I was at medical school and in, in, at MIT in my engineering, I've viewed longevity as something that was malleable. I remember watching a television show on long-lived sea life and seeing that bowhead whales could live 200 years and Greenland sharks could live 500 years. 
And I remember thinking to myself, if they can live that, that long, why can't I? And I said, it's either hardware or software, and we're going to be able to make a dent in that. And I think this is the decade. I call it you know, the decade of the health span revolution because of the tools we have in terms of AI, what's coming later this decade in terms of quantum chemistry and quantum compute, um, gene therapies, cell therapies, synolytic therapies, all of these things converging. Um, at the same time, we have more people in the field and we have more capital flowing in the field. So all of these things are leveraging each other and they're going to make for a incredible decade ahead. If you're still here after the longest video on this channel so far, thank you. And of course, thanks again to Peter and Jamie for giving me so much of their time. I hope you enjoyed this deep dive into the new largest ever X Prize. I think one of the most important things the prize will allow us to do is have these conversations, from science to funding to ethics, that are so critical to driving the field forward. And I hope this video has showcased a bit of that. What do you think about this prize? And what about aging science excites you the most? Let me know in the comments. And if you want a deeper dive into any of the ideas from this video, do leave a comment too. I'm always wondering what you're wondering about aging biology. Finally, please do give this video a like and subscribe to my channel. And if you enjoyed this conversation, you'll definitely enjoy the free bonus chapter of my book on the ethics of treating aging, which you can get here, and my other videos on my aging biology playlist. So check those out too. Thanks for joining us and maybe see you again next time.